Today we're going to discuss that force that helps you to float in the water, the buoyant force. Before we do that, we're going to review a few key concepts. First one being density. I think most of you know that density is the mass per unit volume of a substance, or it could be an object. We typically use a Greek letter rho for density, a small m for mass, and a big V for volume. You should know that the density of water is one gram per centimeter cubed, or one gram per milliliter. So a milliliter or a cubic centimeter of water would have a mass of one gram. Whereas if you are looking at gold, a cubic centimeter would have a much larger mass. It's much more dense. It would have a mass of 19.3 grams. Now I'm sure you already know what pressure is, so I'll go through this very quickly. Pressure is simply the force per unit area. So the units there are going to be force units, newtons, divided by area units, meters squared. And we have a special name for a newton per meter squared that's called a pascal. And you've probably heard that atmospheric pressure at sea level is equal to 101.3 kilopascals or over 100,000 pascals. Let's say we've got a window with an area of one meter squared. Then the force on that window would be equal to the pressure times the area. That would be 101, 300 pascals or newtons per meter squared times one meter squared. So that force is going to be over 100,000 newtons. An absolutely enormous force. It's not a problem because we've got the same force on each side of the window. So there's no unbalanced force. But if we could seal a house and hook up a giant vacuum and pump all the air out of the inside of the house, then we'd have an unbalanced force and that window would implode. It would come shattering inwards. So what is it that causes this buoyant force? Let's consider a very deep lake. And we're going to place this uh, humongous cylinder 10 meters below the surface of the lake. And our cylinder itself is 10 meters in length. Now our cylinder might be more dense than water, in which case it would sink, or it might be less dense than water, in which case it would rise. But that doesn't affect the buoyant force. But that has no effect on the buoyant force. Let me show you what the buoyant force is all about. You probably know that as you go deeper in the water, the water pressure becomes larger and larger. And it turns out that at sea level, the pressure is one atmosphere, 101.3 kilopascals. If you go 10 meters below the surface, the pressure is two atmospheres. So if you're familiar with scuba diving, you probably know this rule. Every time you go down 10 meters, the pressure increases by one atmosphere. And when you get down 20 meters below the surface, the pressure would be up to three atmospheres. Now, the water pressure always pushes perpendicular to the surface. If you go down a little deeper, it gets stronger. On the sides, though, of course, those pressures are going to cancel out. They're going to be equal and opposite. But at the top, you've got a small pressure. And at the bottom, you've got the largest pressure. So we end up with this upward force, which we call the buoyant force. And the reason we get that upwards of buoyant force is because the pressure on the bottom surface is more than on the top. If we have a nice simple cylinder, it's actually easy to calculate this buoyant force. But of course, most objects don't have nice simple shapes. So we use Archimedes' principle as a more general way of calculating the buoyant force on an object. But Archimedes' principle isn't really something new. It's really just Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So let's imagine we have some big container of water here. And we'll make it like an overflow can. 
and we're going to be able to catch that water in a container down below. Then we take our object and we put it into the water. And of course the water comes up and we're going to catch a volume of water equal to the volume of the ball. Now if we think about Newton's third law, the, the ball, the object, has pushed the water out of the way. So the water, by Newton's third law, is going to push back. And it's that pushback force that is the buoyant force. In fact, Archimedes' principle says that the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. So our object pushes a weight of water out of the way, pushes it to the outside. And the water pushes back with an equal and opposite force. And that equal and opposite force is the buoyant force. So the weight of this fluid would be equal to the upward buoyant force on the object. Notice that the buoyant force really has nothing to do with the weight of the object itself, but really just with the volume of the object. The bigger the volume, the more water is displaced, and the larger the weight of that water. You probably already know that objects that are more dense than water sink and objects that are less dense than water, they float. What we'd like to do here is show that that's true using Archimedes' principle. So let's start with the free body diagram. We're going to have some object here that's going to be underwater. And we do a free body diagram. Of course, the weight of the object will act downwards and then the buoyant force will act upwards so let's look for the conditions for which we'd have sinking. So if we're going to get sinking, then we should have that mg is bigger than the buoyant force. The buoyant force is equal to the weight of the water displaced, which would be equal to the mass of displaced water times g. Now the mass of the displaced water, if we think in terms of density, we know density is mass per unit volume. So to get a mass, we'd multiply density times volume. But it's water we're dealing with, so it's the density of water that we want to use, times the volume, or the volume of water displaced is just equal to the volume of the object itself. And then we keep the g. Now we can cancel out that acceleration due to gravity and we get that the mass of the object divided by the volume of the object has to be greater than the density of water. But mass over volume for the object is simply the density of the object. So our condition for sinking is that the density of the object is greater than the density of the water or in general of the fluid. And of course we could repeat the process to find out the conditions for floating. So steel is certainly more dense than water. How is it that a steel boat can float? Well, the key idea here is the difference between an immersed object like a boat that's partially in the water and partially out of the water versus a submerged object where the entire object is below the surface. If we had a submerged object, yeah, definitely the weight of the boat would be bigger than that buoyant force and the steel boat's going to sink. But if we have an immersed object, especially a wide object like a boat, then it can displace a lot of water. So in this case, we can have a weight just as big as the buoyant force and in fact that's going to be the condition for it to float. The buoyant force, the weight of the water displaced, will exactly equal the weight of the boat. Okay, let's get you thinking for a second. Pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer. So we've got this balloon that's got a weight on it underneath the water and it's barely able to float so the weight 
of the balloon plus the weight must be balancing off the buoyant force. Now let's suppose we push our balloon down farther. Well, certainly the weight won't change. We're going to have exactly the same weight. That doesn't change. But our buoyant force is going to be slightly less. And the reason for that is that the pressure close to the surface is less than farther down. So we get a larger pressure on that balloon. And of course, the air in the balloon is compressible. That's going to squeeze the balloon. So that balloon's going to become smaller. And that means it displaces less water. And of course, the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the water displaced. So we're going to get a smaller buoyant force. And that means we're going to sink. OK, pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer. So we've got a cylindrical barrel of mass, 50 kilograms, and it's going to be immersed in water. And let's say it's immersed up to a depth, H. The forces acting on that barrel are going to cancel out because it's floating. So that means the weight here, the weight, which is going to be the mass times, we're taking G equal to 10, that's going to be 500 newtons. That's going to have to exactly balance out the upwards force, which is that buoyant force, and is given by the density of the water, the weight of the water displaced. So the density of the water times the volume, but it's just the volume displaced. It's just this volume down here times g, which we'll just take to be 10. So if these two are equal to one another, then we can write that 500 must be equal to the density of water. Well, that's 1,000, 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed using SI units. The volume displaced, well, that would be equal to this area here. And that area is 1 meter squared. So it's going to equal 1 meter squared times h. That's the volume displaced. And then g is, of course, just 10. So we end up with h being equal to 500 divided by 10,000, which is 0 0.05, or just 5 centimeters. So it's only going to immerse itself by 5 centimeters. And that's mostly because it's got a very large area here. So it doesn't have to sink very far to displace a lot of water. One final question. Pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer. So when we take our object and just hang it from a scale, we get a reading here of 2 kilograms. But when we take our object and we submerge it in water, then our reading is only 1.5 kilograms. So we've got the forces acting on our object here. We've got the weight going down. And we know that weight. It's going to be the mass, 2 kilograms, times g. So I'll write that as 2g for the weight. Now the upward forces, well, we're going to have the buoyant force. I'll call that Fb. We've also got to have this force from the scale that's making it suspended. Let's call that S, the suspension force. And it's going to be equal to 1.5 times g. So those forces have to balance out. So we've got to get that the upward force is the buoyant force plus 1.5g must be equal to the downward force, which is 2g. Let's rate the buoyant force in terms of the weight of the water displaced. So that's going to equal the density of water times the volume of the object times g. g's will cancel out. The density of water, we'll write that as 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. So we end up with an expression for the volume, and that's going to be equal to 2 minus 1.5 divided by 1,000. So we get a volume there of 0 0.0005 meters cubed. The density of the object must therefore equal mass over volume, which is 2 kilograms divided by 0 0.0005 meters cubed 
which is a density of 4,000 kilograms per meter cubed. So it must have four times the density of water. Let's summarize the big ideas from the video. First idea would be that the buoyant force is created because there is more fluid pressure on the bottom side of an object. So because that bottom side is deeper, there's more fluid pressure on it, giving rise to a net buoyant force. Second key idea would be Archimedes' principle. And that says that the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. And we said that that was basically an example of Newton's third law, the law of action-reaction. And we can write that as an equation that buoyant force is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. So we can multiply the density of the fluid times the volume of the object. That's going to give the mass of fluid displaced. Then you've got to multiply by g to get the weight of fluid displaced. And then we talked about the difference between a submerged object versus an immersed object. And when we talked about immersed objects, we were really talking about floating objects. For a submerged object, we can distinguish between the case where the buoyant force is bigger than the weight, and of course this is something that's going to float, versus something where the weight is bigger than the buoyant force and the object is going to sink. Or another way of saying that is if the density of the object is greater than the density of the fluid, the object will sink. For immersed objects, that buoyant force has to be equal to with the weight of the object. So it really means that the weight of the water displaced will equal the weight of the object. But of course, this time, it's not the whole object being submerged. It's just part of the object. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.